for tuning into yet another episode in which I talk about issues related to public transport. Um, now, this is probably going to be permanently a two days a week stream, Tuesday and Saturday, um, generally seven in the evening, my time, which is Berlin time. Um, and uh, the... Um, and, the, and the topic last week, the, the topics, the, the two streams last week were about, uh, say last week, Saturday, a week ago and four days ago, the topics were how rapid transit changes cities um, and how it changes where people uh, live, where they work and where they play. Uh, and then um, I talked about, likewise, how high-speed rail, which is in many ways rapid transit, but at... Uh, in an, at an intercity scale, um, and nowhere is it truer than in Japan. The Shinkansen is very much run as like a, a frequent-ish subway system that just connects cities in, in, in a lot of fundamental ways, and um, how it changes the geography of a country. But I was very abstract about what it does to the country with core periphery dynamic. Again, Japan is a very good example of this. Uh, France is another. Um, um, look at the French high-speed rail map here. I mean, it's nice lines connecting Paris to nearly all of the secondary cities. The main misses are Toulouse, which through Bordeaux is four hours, and Nice, which through Marseille on a really slow Riviera line is five and a half from Paris. Um, but I want to talk about how high-speed rail changes not the country writ large, but individual elements of it, which, I mean, individual um, cities and urban regions um, that happen to be connected. Um, and uh, essentially, what does it do for a place to be on the line? And this is the European map, which I think is the most valuable as far as cases go, because um, usually with core periphery dynamic, it essentially reinforces the core. Now, this doesn't mean that the periphery ends up left behind. It does mean that the periphery becomes less economically independent, um, which bothers certain people. Who does it bother? It bothers, it, it bothers the local elite, um, which instead of kind of owning independent things become like subsumed into a larger capital-based organizations, but it doesn't make the city poorer. It doesn't make the city more unequal. Um, it just shuffles things around a little bit. Um, and, uh, but this is something that could happen to anywhere. I mean, any city that is on a, uh, on a, a high-speed rail system. So in, in France, it would be the specific cities that are best connected with the network. Um, in, uh, Germany, where, as you can see here, the network is very much not core periphery. Um, and, uh, it's also not really complete, um, Yellow, so the yellow lines here are 200 kilometers in an hour, often not even 200, but 160 lines that are just upgraded. So the average, so other than Berlin, Hamburg, the average speeds on these are kind of met. Um, and so if you want to look at where the actual high speed lines are, um, yeah, there's one out of Berlin, but it gets to almost Hannover, to, um, to almost Hannover, and then it doesn't, I mean, then you need to, uh, and then you, you need to crawl to the roar. Um, again, it's medium speed line to Hamburg. Um, you can go to Munich, but again, some slogs at low speed. The average speed from Berlin to from Berlin to Menchan is about 150, 160 kilometers an hour on the fastest trains. Most trains are somewhat slower because instead of going like this, they go like this via Leipzig. Leipzig is a terminal station, so trains enter and then back out. Um, Leipzig is not on the line or anything like that. Um, um, Halle is the city, I mean, through trains here, we go through Halle. Uh, this, is Le um, this is Leipzig uh, Hauptbahnhof, so it's a terminus. So trains go in and then um, and, and then go back. Um, and um, so it changes the economic geography of the country, it changes the cultural geography of the country. People do travel uh, more where the trains are. Um, it's actually, I think, a especially European scale would be a really good alternative to 
randomly flying to various tourist destinations. Um, so the train is never going to get you to Thailand, but the train will get you to European, um, warm, to warm European places. Um, it's probably not going to get you to Alicante because Alicante, yeah, you can take it. You can take a high speed train to Alicante from Madrid, but um, the train, even if the, these lines to Barcelona are actually completed, the route from most of Northern Europe is going to be incredibly slow, so probably um, it's essentially going to change the geography of resorts to places that are on the line. Um, and when I say resort, um, don't just think of like a random place with sun and some um, hotel owners. It's going to be a historic place. I mean, in Italy, I mean, Rome, I mean, I don't think it's going to be a short high-speed trip from southern Germany if um, this is actually completed. So when this tunnel is built and if these connections are built as they should be, but it gets mentioned to Rome to a day trip that I would make. Um, from Switzerland, it's going to be a little harder. But um, or, or Lyon, or, or, or this tunnel across the Alps between uh, Lyon and uh, Torino. That's this section is under construction. Um, and yeah, that gets I think Paris to Milan. It's supposed to be four hours. Um, yeah, you can do it. domestic tourism. This is the way it affects an entire system. I'm bringing up Europe and not an individual country. Because at this point, it's kind of hard to imagine a Western European country without an intercity, without a solid intercity rail network. Um, and um, so it's just easier to point out what could happen further. Uh, the, the fact that probably the biggest destinations of domestic, the, the most notable destinations of domestic tourism are not on such a network. Um, that is to say, the Riviera is, Nice is literally the farthest away city from Paris by train. Um, in France, um, people still sometimes take the train, but, but I think they, but they fly more than they take the train. Um, so this is, so again, I just can't give it as an example because it's still mostly an air traffic corridor, although, although even the 530 train gets semi-decent ridership. Um, so this is how it affects the, again, the entire country, how people travel and giving some examples for leisure, but also business, which is where the core periphery dynamic comes from. But it's better to also talk not just about how it affects countries, but an individual city. So what do I mean by an individual city? Um, okay, um, so you use Osaka. Okay, so you talk about, so you tell people in Northern England that Osaka is in relative decline to Tokyo. That is correct, but Osaka is still core and periphery. Um, I don't remember the names of the corporations that are headquartered there, but I know, I think Panasonic is there, right? I think Panasonic is in the clock, I'm not talking. Um, let me check this. Yeah. Uh, it is headquartered in Osaka. Um, yeah. Um, so Osaka, oh, oh, Toshiba as well. Okay. Um. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's all in declining industries, but I mean, Sony is also in a declining. It, but Sony produces the exact same set of goods as Panasonic. Like, I mean, Tokyo, in general, I mean, it's not that um, it's not that Osaka is in decline. It's just Japan um, is stuck in second and a half gen um, mobile tech. So feature phones, not smartphones. Like the smartphones killed them, and um, I mean, it's the same thing with Finland, like, I mean, Finnish economic growth has not been amazing, no, I don't want your um, migration, okay, let's not do Norway, because it's going to be off the chart, because they have oil, but um, let's do the um, three non-Norway um, Nordic countries, um, Finland and Sw so Finland was always a little poor, was always poorer than Sweden, but it basically converged by the nineties. Then they stayed about the same, and then it looks like Finland just had a worse recession, but it's not actually true. Like the decline in the initial recession is bigger is bigger in Finland, but not by much. Um. It's just that Sweden recovers faster. This is, by the way, not a matter of um, 
So um, Finland, been around. Finland's on the euro, and Sweden and Denmark are not. But also Finland, but Sweden and Denmark did the same austerity as the eurozone. Um, it's the same thing in Britain. Um, so tech, so there's kind of meme among. I want to say Europhobes, but I don't. But it's people. But it's usually not the people you think of as euro skeptics. Even in Britain, it's usually Americans who argue against the euro. That look, the euro made countries poorer or something. Um, because of austerity, but Sweden did the same. Like Sweden had a budget. Sweden had budgetary austerity in this uh, in this entire period. Um, the issue is that Finland's industry is that something like twenty percent of Finnish exports um, in the mid two thousands were Nokia, and Nokia was doing was making some amazing cell phones for the mid two thousands, and then came the smartphone revolution and killed them all. And as a result. Um, Finland, which had very small contraction in Corona, it was it and Norway were two were Europe's two best Corona fortresses. Um, it took Finland until to, until last year just to get back to the per capita GDP that it had on the eve of the Great Recession. So, um, this is. About so, so, so sometimes it's not about cities, but about countries, and this is really important because a lot of urbanists, um, I think, underrate the importance of countries um, as units of economic analysis. Um, and then we and, and then we have um, Denmark and uh, Sweden, which happily are growing. Sweden took a larger contraction because uh, it turns out that um, mass that when the public health head uh, is a mass murderer. Uh, even when the mass murder is, let's pretend there's no corona, it does create economic problems. Uh, at any rate, so I want to talk about the impact of high speed rail on specific cities. Um, as I said, the countries are really important in economic analysis, which is what I devoted the video um, from Tuesday to it. But I want to talk about individual cities and, and, and regions. And um, I think the best example of this is Lille. Why am I on Google Earth? I need to be on the European map. Um, is Lille. And why Lille specifically? Uh, because everywhere in France, again, except Nice, which is economically weird in many ways, everywhere in France is within, high, um, is within easy high-speed rail trip of Paris. Lille, yeah, it's closer than the other cities for the most part, but that's not special. That's not special. Um, there's, I mean, the fact that Lille is an hour and change from Paris and not two hours like Lyon, that's not, I mean, yeah, it's closer, but that's not going to make a huge difference. The real issue with Lille is that it's the junction between Paris, Brussels, and London. Um, and this has been very heavily marketed um, just because of a lot of very Eurostar and uh, very Eurostar specific marketing, something called the Three Capitals route. Um, again, Paris, Brussels, London, um, with Lille having great access to all of them, and this is pretty special within France. Um, now, I'm going to check whether I can easily find America 2050 Lille. Um, whether they're still going to talk about this uh, American high-speed rail, because certainly in the Obama era, uh, so certainly in the Obama era, there were a lot of, uh, uh, there was, uh, yeah, okay, this is a really good example of what I'm talking about. It's not going to sound as a thing now, but um, here there are people who I know, and I, so I know Tony Dutzek is generally very solid on these things. Um, Petra is also um, pretty solid in her analysis. And these are people who uh, talk about uh, how high speed rail changes the world. This actually, this is um, so we should do a public interest network or mass PIRG, you can get this from Google. Um, and again, um, and post the link in chat for you guys. Um, you can click. If you're on YouTube, then Google this. 
Um, so note what they're saying about how it affects cities. So um, they're talking about Frankfurt, Cologne, but these are two very, but these are two core cities to Germany. So, okay, it's just economic activity. Let's look at the others. Um, uh, they're talking about office space near the station, Lyon, uh, the Shinkansen, and uh, specifically Lille, just because Lille, again, is so unique in being so close to three different core areas. Um, Lyon, for example. So Lyon is not that peripheral to the front. Okay, this is perfume. Lyon is not that um, peripheral to France. Um, it's the richest part of... So it's hard to say what the richest part of provincial France is just because there's such a big difference. I think that actually the richest department outside in de France might actually be Alpes-Maritimes. I think it's Alpes-Maritimes and um, Barin. But Barin and Barin. Um, and um, not Rhône, but it's like a, the level of a border region, um, Rhône Alp is pretty wealthy. Um, and again, a lot of it is just internal. I mean, Lyon has been France's second for a while. And uh, I bring this up because Lille, um, being close to a bunch of different core regions, should be doing the best. And they're specifically talking about how the city used its train station to um, do a lot of transit-oriented development with 6,000 new jobs. Now, I do have per capita income by region of Europe on this. This goes, this goes until 2019, so the eve of corona. Um, some places don't have 2019 data, only 2018. That's not going to matter too much for our purposes. So... Um, Let's go and see what it is like in France. Okay, so Ile de France. Okay, um, and I'm going and because you can't see over my head, uh, this should. Um, I'm gonna scroll down. Actually, you know what? Um. I don't want to remove. Let's just kill this for one moment. Um, it's probably the easiest. And so, look at the per capita incomes. Um, Ile de France is far and away the uh, the best. Um, Rhône Alpes is Lyon. Um, and it's number two, and then it's Alsace, and then it's Paca, which is Marseille and Nice. Nice is the rich part. Marseille is the poor part. Here is. Nord Pas de Calais. Nord Pas de Calais is the region that Lille is the capital of. In fact, it's a region that kind of exists to just be the Lille region. It is not a historic region of France the way that, let's say, Paca isn't quite, but I mean, Provence plus regions that are effectively Provence. Nord Pas de Calais, so Nord uh, Pas de Calais, Pas de Calais um, it's just two departments that kind of became a region more in a, they have more of an industrial history. There was a, a bunch of coal here. Um, there were historically a bunch of different regions. Essentially, when France was setting up these regions, it figured out it's a good region to be around, to be as a, as a region for Lille. Like, a, a lot of these regions were set up to be about um, um, a specific secondary city um, as a kind of economic development program. So, Ronald is also not a, uh, Ronald is also not a real historic region. It is a, it is essentially a bunch of departments surrounding Lyon, so Ronald. Um, Paca, again, it, it, there is a historic core there that just essentially melded Nice into it. Um, and um, at any rate, look again at the income in Nord Pas-de-Calais. Nord Pas-de-Calais is literally the poorest part of metropolitan France. Um, actually, no, Languedoc-Roussillon is poor. Um, I'm sorry, it is the second poorest part. It somehow manages to be poorer than Corsica. Um, and Corsica is... Corsica is traditionally thought of as the poorest part of France. Um, it's poorer than, like, some really out there, like, rural regions that have been, um, 
no, they've never even deindustrialized. They've been in decline because industrialization happened elsewhere. It's 150 years of history of decline in areas like Limousin, like um, Limousin or in uh, Porto, um, or Auvergne, uh, and or Pas de Coleman, just to be poor. Um, now I can like try to show you growth history of this, but it's not going to be that interesting. The reason being, so this goes back to the beginning of the recession, um, and yeah, already th I mean already then. No, Pas de Calais was um, on the poor side, but the train, but, but the line opened in 1993. So any, uh, um, so any economic redevelopment would have happened 90s. So, so any kind of rebound would have happened 90s, early 2000s, not last 10 years. And um, let's get back to, to this. You don't need to look in the bottom market anymore. And so, at least at some level, it needs to be understood that you can build. Pretty good trains um, that take you from Lille to Paris very frequently at an affordable fare, to uh, Brussels less frequently at a less affordable fare, and to London less frequently with security theater and with fares that will make you want to uh, enlist in a Stalinist militia. Um, and are uh, the um, and that's not. And, but I mean, I mean, it might make want, but it, it might make you want to enlist in the Stalinist militia. But the people who actually pay these fares think that's normal. That yeah, obvi I mean, yes, it's expensive, but obviously, such a good product should be expensive. And then they don't think about what. And because the sort of people who take Eurostar don't take domestic trips, don't take domestic trips within France. They don't ask themselves, wait, why is this so much more expensive? Or, or if they do, they think in terms of some kind of business decision, or they come up with the idea, or they come up with the impression that Paris to Lyon, Paris to Marseille are somehow subsidized, which they very definitively are not. Um, the Tejeva network makes money. The Tejeva network makes money to pay down construction costs. Um, some parts of it make more money than others. Paris to Lyon is a giant profit center. Paris to Marseille also makes money. I think the trains to Nice don't just because they charge the same fares as Paris to Marseille and it's a lot of winding at low speed here and especially towards the end, the train is not very full. Like it, it's full like up until Marseille and Toulon and then slowly thins out. Um, oh, hi. Um, they already tried the Stalinist militia. Um, yes, it was called the Red Army, and actually did really well in the war. Uh, turns out that when the United States uh, funds most of your material production, um, you can win while being um, a uh, communist country under the rule of um, Joseph Stalin. Anyway, um, the uh, and they certainly did not have overpriced high-speed trains or high-speed trains of any kind in the Soviet Union. So technically, what he said is correct. Um, technically, um, and, uh, so I want to make it very clear that this does create economic development, that they're not lying here about these jobs. It just, it centralizes development in the region around, um, the core of the city. Um, it's not a bad thing, but it's also not going to turn, it's not, I mean, people have dreams about, Making a deindustrialized region great again should not use high speed rail. It should not do anything. I don't think that's really possible to do through a policy intervention. Um, the examples I do know of a declining region that's kind of undeclined happened through things that were pretty random. Um, there's actually a paper by um, Ed Glaser. So you want to look at Ed Glaser's economic history of Boston. We don't need this anymore. Um, it's, uh, Ed Glaser's economic history of Boston, where he points out that Boston was not doing well in the middle of the 20th century. In fact, in um, Joel Gross and I, the Nine Nations of North America, it is pointed out that New England is relative to cost of living the poorest part of the United States. That was 40 something years ago. That would be ridiculous, a ridiculous thing to claim now. There's something called the Massachusetts Miracle, which if you knew where to look, was already evident when the book was written in the late 70s, but it kind of boomed much more so than in the 1980s. Um, Boston became the second city of the American tech industry. Um, and uh, this was um, essentially because Boston had very high levels of education, just because it 
a legacy of universities that in the 1960s and 70s were mostly mocked as Boston Brahmins. Uh, and that turned out to be economic development. Oh, um, you're going to guess that if LA got itself together, it would be something like Sydney. Um, yeah, about um, yeah, about uh, redevelopment. Yeah, about, about um, transparent development. Yes. Uh, also, I, will, I should point out that um, this is a really good example that people should look to and uh, grow in regions with demand growth because Sydney. Sydney is not as aggressively EMB as, let's say, Seoul or Tokyo or Istanbul, but it is a pretty healthy builder of housing. Um, it might actually build more, it probably builds more housing than any larger, per capita than any larger English speaking city region, right? Because New York and London are both NIMBY. I guess Toronto is bigger than, I mean, um, LA is very NIMBY. Chicago, I don't know how NIMBY it is, but also there's not a lot of demand for Chicago. Um, uh, Dallas, Houston, Atlanta, I think are bigger than Sydney, but I think Sydney actually builds more than them. Um, Dallas and Houston don't build that much anymore. I mean, they build a lot by New York standards. I don't think they build a lot by... They probably build around as much as Stockholm, I guess, per capita. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, it's something. this is something where I can actually tell you what the policy intervention is, which is build more housing. Um, something that LA dislikes doing. Eventually, the state will um, do something even more aggressive than builders already. Um, but yeah, anyway. So going back to this, um, the the upshot is that you're not actually going to turn Lille to make Lille great again. Boston again. Boston became great again, and um, starting in if you know where to look, sixties and seventies, but much more visibly 80s, 90s, um, and ongoing to the point that at this point it's thought of as not just... Um, a no so in the 1970s, there was this mentality that, oh, uh, um, Texas is where the real... Uh, or the sun or California, which I think was unbelt, was the real source of American uh, economic power and uh, the East Coast, except maybe New York, I mean, even New York with, uh, in the 1970s, um, we're just a bunch of um, freeloaders with a lot of industrial uh, legacy and um, unions and uh, um, too much welfare or whatever, and uh, they and they need to be disciplined to be as wealthy as Texas. And at this point, people still hate people in the rest of the country still hate Boston, but they don't hate Boston for being deindustrialized. They hate Boston for being too wealthy. And again, it's. Most economic histories will say that it's because the universities made it a really good um, place to do um, high value added industries as they kept growing into the late 20th century and ongoing. Um, I'm actually really optimistic about the economic future of Boston because um, the tech industry is kind of running, um, is it, it, kind of peaking at this point. Um, as I keep telling, as I keep telling people, among the big profitable, self-owning that is not acquired by a bigger tech firm, tech firms. Um, the most recently founded was Facebook, which was 2004. Um, Twitter is self-owning. I mean, yes, Elon Musk bought it, but it was bought by, but it, 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 it's not like a different tech firm bought it. It's It was Twitter and, and now it's still Twitter. It's not like Instagram, which was bought by Facebook, but Twitter, um, Twitter is not profitable um, or it's barely profitable. Um, Zoom looked like it could be the next one, but it, um, but it wasn't. I'm actually not sure why. People use Zoom a lot more than they did before Corona, and yet Zoom's, and then essentially Zoom gave up all the stock market increase during early Corona. Um, Instagram is huge, but it's, uh, bought by Facebook. TikTok is huge. Um, TikTok is also emphatically not Silicon Valley. Um, I don't actually know which Chinese city by then um, it's based in. Let me actually check that. Um, that can't be Shenzhen, is it? I think Shenzhen is electronics. But I don't actually... Um, yeah, Beijing. Okay. Um, but, um, but anyway, so um, the tech industry is speaking, and so I'm not as optimistic about the future of San Francisco, but the economic future of San Francisco. I mean, San Francisco is like at the top of the world. Like, I mean, it's 
a lot wealthier at this point than Munich. I mean, and at this point, I'm saying five years ago than Munich. Um, so when you're when you're at the top of the world, the only place to go is down. But Boston has a lot of biotech. Um, Moderna is headquartered in Cambridge. Um, Pfizer is um, New York, and I think their main side, their main actual labs and such are in Central Jersey. Um, and so the um, so 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 this is in, but but this is just but it's not something like there was a policy in Boston to. It's it's not like there was an industrial policy in Boston that paid off. Um, the industrial policy that people were trying to do in the sixties and seventies as the, um, in northeastern decline was to have higher tariffs and try to reindustrialize, and this is not what happened at all. So you're not going to make a. Re I mean. Can can a declining region be made great again? Yeah, it absolutely can. Um, I don't think that infrastructure can do it as a matter of uh, as a matter of industrial policy. Um, again, it didn't happen in Lille beyond these six thousand jobs in a city in a city region of one point something million. Uh, it uh, didn't happen in so, so in Japan. Um, it's hard to say what exactly happened in Japan in general. I will say that one specific place in Japan that was supposed to be helped by the Shinkansen wasn't necessarily transformed positively, and that is Niigata. So my understanding is what happened in Niigata, and borders correct me if I'm bullshitting. Um, in Niigata, um, this was kind of this was, this was a throwaway line. So the core part of the Shinkansen is the north-south trunk, which is let's. It, they never, which is Tokyo south to um, Fukuoka, um, and Tokyo north to um, originally it was uh, Morioka, then Hachinoha, and, and now Shinomori, and I guess at this point uh, Shinokodate. Um, off the kind of main line that runs like this, the biggest thing is the Jutsu Shinkansen. This was a line that everyone went to. The, everyone knew it was going to be unprofitable. I think at this point, JR East makes a profit out of it after a lot of restructuring. But this line was known to be unprofitable when the decision to build it was made because the prime minister was from it. This is like a lot of it is just LDP corruption. And here's the thing Niigata is a ski resort town. Um, it is extremely snowy, and um, this map doesn't show you why. Um, my understanding is that, so I don't know if it's literally snowiest in the world, but the snowiest places in the world tend to be places that um, have, um, that, um, so first of all, we have to be in like a, at least somewhat boreal latitude. I mean, I shouldn't call 30 something boreal, but it, it's a temperate latitude. Um, so the wind comes from the west. You need to be west coast, but in a situation where other where you're not getting where the wind is not going to cool you down. If you're a normal west coast, let's call it Britain or Pacific Northwest, you're just gonna get mild winters. So you need to have so the so the snowiest places in the world um that are like first world cities as possible and missing things that are not as accessible need to be downwind of a lake or a sea that will where they will not cool uh, they will not warm the temperature enough. So upstate New York is the snowiest place in the United States. It's called the Lake Effect. This is because of the Lake Effect snow here. Um, and I think Niigata has even more snow. Um, and, uh, and I think it's partly maybe orographic because um, mountains. So there are a bunch of ski resorts here. And my understanding is that um, the region actually didn't... I mean, I mean, way more people went to the ski resorts. But uh, as a result of the Shinkansen, but many um, switched from staying overnight, to taking day trips. So the ski, so the actual ski, is seeing a lot more traffic. But the overnight stays are less so. Um, and um, so even a region, even a region that's kind of getting that kind of benefit, might. Be having problems, and this is so. Last video um, on Tuesday, I mentioned the example of, Nia of Niagara Falls, because um, in an American context, let's look, just look at this map. This is, as I mentioned um, before, I started streaming. Um, I have a real map of the American high-speed rail network um, at home, 
Um, but um, if we think about what if they was built high speed, or by the way, if you want to go over the color scheme, uh, I'm probably going to update this map on stream on Tuesday, I should say, um, just to talk more about which lines there are better than others. I think the network can be enlarged. Um, but this is a kind of a, a North American network where um, uh, blue means things that are either things I'm not certain about, which is this or things that might work better as a medium speed legacy rail connection. So New Haven, so this is New Haven to Springfield. This is uh, Milwaukee to Green Bay. Uh, but anyway, um, the issue with this map is uh, Niagara Falls can be very easily connected by high speed rail to New York City and Toronto. So, uh, New York, Toronto, uh, Boston. Um, um, and this makes it really accessible. This is a place that just happens to be very beautiful. Oh, oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, it's because they don't have as much, uh, because that would be... Yeah, but because that would be their main place to connect onward to, but I mean, it's not like the East, it's not like the Pacific coast of Japan. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, not the, yeah, it's never the city, the, the LDP is never the city interest, it's, it's the people, it's the, but the resorts are not city, I imagine, it's the places around the city. Um, and then the actual cities, the Niigatas, the, the other secondary cities, I think you were the one who explained to me, or the, or, or, or DPJ, and then they duke it out for Tokyo. Um, but anyway, um, the issue. So this is a, so Niagara Falls actually has has real natural beauty. It also was heavily marketed by the New York Central, and a lot more people are going to travel there if this if a network like this is built. Um, now, the question is, is it going to help with the hotels? So um, there's a place um, uh, on the Canadian. So, so first of all, this would be Canadian side Niagara Falls on American side, just because. There's no real reason to go via America, via Niagara Falls, New York. It's just easier to go direct to Canada. Um, and um, second, it's um, like I don't know what it's going to do to the hotels. Um, I imagine that this might actually be far enough that people would um, overnight. Um, it's probably going to be about three hours, um, New York to Niagara Falls, uh, and. This is something that you can day trip, but it's something that you can also not day trip. Um, and it's possible that um, even if people at this uh, from here day trip, they might not day trip from Chicago. I'm not sure. Um, it just expands access massively. Um, but again, a lot of it is going to be day trips. Um, I don't know if it's going to convert hotel overnight to day trips, but it's plausible again on the Niigata model. Um, after all the resorts in Niigata, again, they're not in the city, so there's it's um, there's also a last mile connection there. Um, the other issue, so um, when you if you go to, Ni to to Niagara Falls, you can, for example, book a tour. There's a there's a tour place you can you can pay and go, and they'll um, let you um, in the cave behind the falls. Um, and uh, I mean, obviously, you're not going to go in the falls; like it's the, the the water curtain will crush you, but a place where it's like a little stream where you can like feel like you're in the waterfall and like see like uh and, and they're gonna talk and they're talking about um like the, the natural history of the area. That is obviously gonna benefit a lot from this connection. The hotels I'm less certain about. Um because the hotels again, I mean the the hotels are something you're overnighting and um maybe people won't do that. Maybe people will Overnight in Toronto, actually, and then day trip from Toronto to uh, to Niagara Falls. That is very plausible. Um, so it's, it is going to create more economic development, maybe not in the place it is most moralized about. Actually, I actually don't know whether Canadians moralize about Niagara Falls. Um, Americans do because Niagara Falls, New York, is an incredibly poor city. Um, I think even by upstate New York standards, it might be very poor. So... Um, it's something where um, 
it is going to so so it so it is more or less an economic development strategy, although to be very clear. American the view from the American side kind of sucks, and if you could cross into Canada, cross into Canada. Um and uh so this is the Niagara Falls issue. Um now I did promise I'm gonna talk about other nodes, the nodes being Philadelphia and Cleveland. Um now when I drew this network, I was drawing it based on my understanding of um how to get good financial return on investment. Um if you're wondering this it's, there's the California network and then the Pacific, the entire Pacific Northwest is in blue, which which here does not stand for low speed, stands for uh probably not economically viable, but maybe. Um it doesn't benefit from the network effects of the entire eastern United States. The total the total population of the metropolitan areas of Portland, Vancouver, and Seattle is about 10 million, and it's growing pretty, or maybe a year, 9 million. Um, it's growing pretty fast because these are probably the most EMB. I think these three cities are plausibly top. I'm not going to say they're in the top five EMBS places in North America, but I think these three might actually be top 10 in how much housing they build per capita in the top 50 North American region. Um, would it make sense to connect uh, California High Speed Rail and Cascadia High Speed Rail? No, for two reasons, which for two separate, although linked reasons. The first re- reason is that between Sacramento and uh, Portland, the population is very limited, um, and most of it is right near Sacramento. So Redding and right near um, Portland, it is Eugene. Um. In between, in between Reading and Eugene, basically not there. The second reason, which is also the explanation for why between Eugene and Reading there's nothing, is uh, can you, does this look to you like a place where it is easy to build a railway? Um, there's a German rail fan who tried figuring this out. Web pages, this is old. This is old internet. This is from 2005. I don't think he has updated this since 2005. Um, this was essentially about how to get, how to connect um, Sacramento and Portland on legacy rail because obviously there was going to be a high-speed rail line through here with tunnels. Um, and essentially it has to be just night trains, maybe a day to day train, but not really. Like, this is just bad geography for this. Um, if the population of California were twice and the population of the Pacific Northwest were twice, I still don't think it would make sense. Um, that dreadful. Um, how could the Pacific Northwest benefit of the reduced goal to reduce freeway congestion? Um, oh, okay, so you're doing, okay, so, yeah, I mean, you can always crayon, I mean, you can also crayon a transatlantic tunnel between New York and London, I mean, the technology for that kind of exists, um, remember, Hyperloop, like, the technology for Hyperloop exists, has been tested, it's not even that exciting, because if you're, um, um, railway builders have, for at least a generation, been able to build under kilometers of overburden through the mountains. Um, if you're proofing that, you can also evacuate the tunnel. Um, that's not the hard part. The hard part is, I mean, you you can do a floating tunnel, that's gonna, like a, a floating tube, because I'm gonna go up to the bottom of the ocean for kilometers. But um, that's not the hard part. The hard part is, oh my God, the construction costs. Um, and um, so, Okay, if your goal is to reduce freeway congestion, yeah, that's valid. But essentially, this is, I don't know, I don't know if there's a good term for this. I mean, the, the neutral term for this is um, social or economic benefits. So essentially, instead of doing financial return of an, on investment, that is, you compute construction costs and then you compute um, uh, revenue um, and operating profits, which again, exists. High speed rail is operationally profitable everywhere that I know of. Um, it may not always be capable of paying off construction costs. Essentially, 
the return on investment is always positive, but might be less than the cost of capital, um, which I think is the case for some out there Spanish lines. The construction costs are very low, but the ridership in Spain is beyond horrendous. Um, maybe also China, I'm less certain about China. Um, like I think the fair revenues in China might be lower than in richer countries. Um, but in the long run, I mean, in, in the long run, Chinese... I mean, China might have a middle income trap. It's not going to have a middle income trap. Even at the... Uh, I don't like the color thing you're doing to me, computer. Um, like, if China, I mean, China can hit a middle income trap, but probably not its present GDP per capita, but it still is growing. Um, despite Xi Jinping's best attempts um, to um, play HO4, HOI4 um, as a challenge run. And, uh, but anyway, so this map, I was, I, I think the, I set the minimum financial ROI for a line to appear on the map 2%. Um, the maybe, the blue maybes are, I think, 1 or 1.5%, one this and this. Um, I'm forgetting what I saw from this. Um, and I can get much higher numbers if you, so I, so this map I did by hand, which is why on Tuesday I'm going to add more things to it. Um, but by doing it by hand, it means that there were the obvious parts like Northeast Carter and tie-ins. And beyond that, I just computed expected profits from main connections. So let's say from uh, Memphis, I looked at the connect at the, uh, at ridership to, let's say, Nashville, Atlanta, up the line to Chicago, maybe to Cleveland. But there's a longer tail there. So, I mean, New York... I don't know to what extent it's significant as far as Memphis, but if you're trying to compute the ROI on Atlanta to Florida, trips from New York to Florida are not very, are not a huge part of the extra um, expected revenue, but they do exist. Um, they are they are seen like northeast of Florida, um, even though it's likely most people will fly. Um, I don't fully trust the model at this distance, but it, it's what the model says. Um, and the thing is, if you're including social benefits, you need to include them equally for everything. And there's a rub. I mean, 2% ROI, financial ROI is low. It's about the long-term cost of capital in a country that people don't expect to um, go bankrupt. Um, and when I say people, I don't mean conspiracy theorists who think that... Uh, Anything other than the gold standard is a reptilian um, conspiracy to uh, um, dilute the white race or something. I mean, like, actual investors with money. A few of them might actually believe in, in reptilian conspiracy theories, but neither the average nor the marginal investor does. So, um, the, so 2% is not the best because usually you want to, because there's risk. Um, and... Essentially, when you include the social benefits, that is how you convert 2% to a threshold that is more risk-adjusted, which is 4 or 5%. And so, yes, you can include benefits like um, environmental benefits um, of getting people to take the train instead of flying. Um, where are these environmental benefits greatest? Where people take the train the most. Like all of these benefits, reduced congestion, economic development, environmental benefits, they're pretty much proportional to ridership. Um, and so I don't want to play revenue games because they're not they're not quite proportional to revenue because you can jack up fares, e.g. Eurostar, and, um, the, and then the economic benefits. The economic benefits kind of stay, scale with ridership or passenger kilometers. Um, but, um, uh, but if you kind of fix the fares at a normal level, um, normal level should probably be comparable to domestic European high-speed rail fares, which are about 15 American cents. I mean, in PPP terms, it's something like 11 euro cents per passenger kilometer on average. Um, it's somewhat digressive, so um, in Europe it would be more per kilometer for a short trip, less for a long trip. Um, this also incorporates discounts, so undiscounted drifts are going to be more than if you benefit from, let's say, my 
bulk out 25 than you pay less. But this is the average. And um, the and so if you fix the fares that way, then um, all these social and environmental and economic benefits, um, it's a really question, but all of these benefits are proportional to ridership. So essentially, if you include them, then the ROI, so this map does not show you ROI except very vaguely in red and some blues, but not others. Um, but um, the... Uh, so, so essentially, it would give everyone more ROI, but it would also increase the threshold, so the map would look the same. Um, so, so, so thank you for asking me, it's a really good question, but, it's, but the answer is, it's just a matter of simplifying the analysis by not micromanaging which environmental benefits count and just doing a flat multiplier. Um, so at any rate... Um, in a uh, and, and, and a lot of people complain because the Pacific Northwest looks like an obvious high speed rail region, but just not a lot of it, not a lot of people live there. Um, so anyway, the issue is places that are nodal to the network. Um, so what places are nodal to the network? I mean, New York is a really good one because New York has trains on this map going in three directions: north, uh, northeast toward Boston southwest toward Philadelphia and Washington or toward the Midwest and due north toward upstate New York and Canada. But I would not call New York the node, right? It's like calling Paris the node of the Tejava and trying to figure out whether um, the Tejava system has improved economic development in Ile-de-France. That is kind of weird because the whole point of the Tejava is to connect provincial France to Paris. Provincial France benefits from connecting to Paris. Paris, yeah, benefits from the, the changes in the corporate free dynamic. But fundamentally, on the level of travel, Paris connects to peripheral cities. High-speed rail, I, I mean, the, the purest gravity model is symmetric. The gravity model tells us that when you build, um, it, it, the, that the gravitational attraction between two bodies is exactly the same. The force, the gravitational force in physics that the Earth um, exerts on you is the... I, I will answer this in a sec. The gravitational force that the Earth exerts on you is the exact same uh, force in Newtons as the gravitational force that you exert on the Earth. However, F equals MA, this gravitational force divided by... Um, uh, your mass is um, always going to be uh, about 9.8 meters per second square, um, because it scales also with your mass, so it cancels out. And the gravitational force that you exert on the Earth depends on your mass, but take 9.8 meters per second squared and divide that by the mass ratio between the planet and you. Um, but it's symmetric. Um, an economic gravity models are also to first order symmetric. Now, what do I mean by to first order they're symmetric? Um, more people travel from the suburbs of a city to the city than they do from the same city to the suburbs. So in practice, you should expect um, the gravity model to overrate how many people in the city visit the provinces and underrate how many people in the provinces visit the city. But again, this is we're not going to deal with that for, for first order models. There's a reason why I put a picture of a fantasy barbarian in every blog post I write on this. Um, so, um, the model tells us that, for example, New York to Boston trips or New York to Washington trips, and probably the model is actually going to be correct about this because these are all core, like the, the entire East Coast is kind of the economic core of the United States. California is a second economic core. Um, um, there are places that are still pretty economically productive, Texas, for example, Chicago, um, but are nowhere near as wealthy. Uh, and um, so New York and Boston, so New York, Boston is probably going to be symmetric, and likewise New York, Washington. But what does this mean? It means the same number, again, to first order approximation, of New Yorkers are going to travel to Boston as Bostonians are to New York. But New York is much bigger city than Boston, right? The, the New York region, my model works. With, so 
the stations here are depicted as like as like individual station locations, but the model, the modeling I'm doing because again I'm explicitly using um, primitive models. Um, is at the combined statistical area level. So, from the perspective of the model, all of this, all of the stuff I'm circling, New ha from as far as New Haven, Poughkeepsie, and Trenton is in New York. And then, actually, I don't, I don't think I even modeled um, the London. Um, and then, all of these, the Boston, Worcester, Providence are Boston because combined statistical area. Likewise, Philadelphia and Wilmington. Um, likewise, everything in the Baltimore and Washington region actually. Quantico as well. Um, so um, this blob has 23 million people. This blob is about 7 million people. And gravity model tells us the same number of people. So per capita, it's three times as much here as here, which makes sense. Why? New York is three times as big as Boston, so per capita, three times as many people are going to travel to New York as to Boston. Um, and so um, the impact is mostly on the secondary cities, because again, same number of travelers, but they're split across a smaller population in the secondary cities. Um, and again, I mean secondary in the sense of population, not in the sense of income. I believe that corrected for... Um, so, so overall income, if you subtract, if you just net out rents, is still higher per capita in New York than in Boston, I think. Um, but I think if you do full regional price parities in Boston and Washington, are both richer than New York. Um, no, regional price parities are really weird because the um, because the way they handle rent is a little sus, essentially, because um, the American housing market is not very marketized. So um, what you pay... Um, depends on whether you are from the city or not from the city, even in places without rent control like Boston. And um, so and so it's not necessarily as relevant to a migrant. Um, who's, and I mean, literally, like, the, and, and literally the mechanisms through which um, these things equalize, the um, regional price, per, the, the, the per capita incomes um, equalize through people moving to richer regions. So this is where it's got, it gets a little soft. But anyway, um, so okay, you're asking me about not, would night train HSR ever work? I don't know. Would intercity buses make better sense? I mean, there already are intercity buses, right? I mean, I don't actually know what happened to Bolt since I took it 10 years ago. Oh my god, it was actually 10 years ago, yeah. Um, when, I, when, I, when I took a bus from uh, Sal to uh, Vancouver, but... Um, if it's so, I, um, I so the, the problem with upgrades is that you're dealing with um, class one train, um, which has opinions about how the train should be run. Those opinions are extremely trend to the point that the workers don't have sick days. Um, I mean, they literally have. I mean, and I don't mean they don't have sick days in the same in, in the sense that okay, you need to show up to work on these days, and if you're sick, tough luck. No, I mean they're on call twenty four seven. They have a very limited number of days that they can be not on call. Um, I am about to run a D and D game where one of my players is a doctor, um, and so we need to schedule around um, um, the, the doctors. And, 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 and it's not a, and, and they're not a private practice doctor; they work at a hospital. So um, b between them and like and other doc and, and other um, gamers who I know are doctors, I'm hearing a lot about these schedules. There are pretty horrific rotations um, with brutal hours. But most of the time, a doctor is not on call. Thank you very much. I mean, the, the, the uh, American capitalism is aware that um, if you try to treat doctors the way you treat railroad workers, you're not going to get doctors. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is why I'm not sure. I'm not saying that it's not possible. I'm saying that the class one freight lines have done a lot of surplus extraction. Um, I will rant on Q, and by I will, I mean I have, I don't remember on one video about how this line, Chicago to St. Louis, um, got all the high-speed rail funds in the Obama stimulus, and I think at the end of the day, they're only going to speed the trains up by 15 minutes because, um, because essentially all of the money leaked to Union Pacific demanding capacity improvement, $2 billion. Um, I think it was $2 billion of federal and state money that made the, that sped up this thing five-hour trip by 15 minutes. 
Um, and so anyway, um, the issue is that high-speed rail benefits the secondary cities more than the primary. Again, you need to believe in the... Uh, sorry, at, okay, what do you mean by benefit? As consumers, it benefits the secondary cities more than the primary. Um, as producers, it's going to be proportional. Um, and um, although actually even, even as producers, it makes sense because um, it, it's the same effect it obtains, right? Because in New York, again, let's just pretend that there's nothing in America beyond New York and Boston. Um, New York, um, even if that doesn't exist, this is a really strong high-speed line. Honestly, if Boston doesn't exist, New York to Providence is a surprisingly strong high-speed line. Um, so New York to Providence, not New York to Providence, New York to Boston. Um, again, we're expecting symmetric numbers of people traveling New York to Boston as Boston to New York. So first of all, it means fewer, again, one-third as many New Yorkers as Bostonians are going to travel. But also, the net amount of Boston's traveling to New York, because Boston is one-third the size of New York, is one-third as much per capita Per, or sorry, per New York capita, as New Yorkers traveling to Boston per Boston capita. So the impact on, let's say, the tourism industry is also going to be more on smaller cities. Um, so New York, again, even though it is, no, it is a node, I mean, it's not really, I mean, it's a node, but it's a node because it's the biggest city in um, the Western world. Um, and, and, and so, I mean, no, no, literally, like the only larger first world cities than New York are Tokyo and Seoul. Um, and so, yeah, of course, this is going to drive a lot of ridership. Um, and, but what about the secondary cities that happen to be nodes for a network? Where, again, I don't give a shit about the politics or, or reviving um, cities and making them great again, just between big cities, this is where you go. And sometimes the geography makes certain locations more favored. Like Albany is kind of a center where you can get to Montreal, Boston, the rest of upstate New York and Toronto, and New York. Um, Philadelphia happens to be a junction. Um, New York, Washington, and Midwest. Cleveland actually is a really big junction of this because um, the, the issue is that the location of... Um, so and the issue is, it, it's not. So if Cleveland did not exist, this would not be a node. Um, this is because Cleveland exists. And this is really important. There always has to be something for development to build itself up from. You can't just build a random city in the desert, call it Prionopolis and uh, or Madi or, or Madinat al Minsad. Not Minsad. I'm speaking Hebrew. Madinat al Minshad. Um, and uh, um. And expect people to uh, and, and expect people to live there. I mean, you can do it as a vanity project, but that's a vanity project. If you want this to actually do economic development, it has to start with something. And the re and the something here is that um, because Cleveland is one of the largest metro areas in the Midwest, um, it's a really attractive route for, let's say, Chicago to Pittsburgh. I mean. Cleveland is bigger than Pittsburgh, so it's not, it's not like it's just randomly there or anything. But but the point is that if Cleveland did not exist, and probably Chicago to Pittsburgh, I mean, let's see. First of all, maybe Chicago to Detroit would not go via Toledo. Maybe it would be better to go via the more traditional route that the trains take now, which is kind of the I-94 route, this one, via hitting more cities in Michigan. But may, um, and so maybe it would be like this, and then the route to the northeast would not go like this at all. It would go maybe via Indianapolis like this. Um, but, the, but the point is, if Cleveland didn't exist, you probably would do something like Pittsburgh direct to Columbus. I'm already seeing people on social media who think that this is better than this. They're wrong. But I can see a world in which a total collapse in Cleveland and continued growth in Columbus would make this more attractive than this. So, um, so the point is that the development has to start from something, which is Cleveland still being the largest metro area at the CSA level um, in Ohio. Um, I don't remember what it's ranking. I want to say it's number four in the Midwest. I think the Midwest goes Chicago, then Detroit, and Minneapolis and Cleveland. Um, but um, but once it, um, but once this thing exists, just because of the location, just because of um, how northeast or Midwest routes are constrained, it kind of becomes the hub. 
um, kind of like the Lille of North America. And my comparison to Lille is very deliberate because Cleveland, like uh, like Lille, is a region which has which is suffering from post-industrial decline. It is distinct from other kinds of decline. I mean, um, for example, maybe not West Virginia, but Southern Appalachia um, is very poor. I mean, West Virginia is also poor, but West Virginia is maybe a little bit more of a full decline. But a place like Kentucky um, or Arkansas um, or the Southern or the Southern Appalachians, it's, these places have never been wealthy. Okay, I mean, um, th- these places were always full of um, sob stories of extremely poor um, people, which were used um, as kind of like the archetype of the American who would be helped by mid 20th century poverty reduction programs. So, um, for example, um, the New Deal created the Tennessee Valley Authority, which did a lot of really good economic development in, um, for example, Tennessee by dam- by uh, damming the river. So there were um, so they figured out that they had something um, good, which was a lot of uh, hydropower resources, and they used it to do a lot of rural electrification. Um, the United States in the 1930s was a mostly electrified country, but the rural South was still unelectrified. Um, and so, um, so they used that to do rural electrification programs. Um, I think JFK actually met some random, really poor person in, I'm forgetting where in Appalachia, maybe Kentucky or West Virginia. Um, it's kind of the example, the exemplar of um, the kind of morally deserving but very poor American who would be helped by the anti-poverty programs that um, a few years later became the Great Society. Um, U.S. Army, what is U.S. Army Midwest? Um, I'm feeling like it's an acronym that I should know, but I'm blanking on. Um, and the point, so, in, so the point is that Kentucky has never been wealthy by American standards. I mean, Kentucky is wealthy by Polish standards. I'm not going to say it's, it's wealthy by German standards. It absolutely hasn't, but it's wealthy by Polish standards. It's definitely po- um, wealthy by Chinese standards, let alone Indian ones, let alone um, Ethiopian ones. But by American standards or Northern European standards, it does not and never has been. Um, but Cleveland is post-industrial decline. Same is true of Detroit. Um, and especially because these are both cities with a lot of um, auto production, um, somehow they're moralized much more so than, let's say, Rochester um, or Syracuse, both of which are also post-industrial decline, just because um, the decline in Rochester and in Syracuse is like different industries, whereas in uh, Cleveland, Detroit, it's the industry that the United States views as the source of its historic industrial uh, strength. The equivalent would be um, borners um, for your whole country in, in Britain, because in Britain... Uh, start the, the industry that everyone privileged, which kind of became somewhat of a labor aristocracy, was um, coal mining. Um, coal miners were viewed, I think, in, by, by let's say post-war labor as maybe more deserving than other, even than other industrial workers, and um, the, and a lot of attention was paid to that, um, to, to their situation specifically, um, and um, the. Uh, and, and as I understand the, and as I understand it, um, these are, these areas also declined first, just because Britain, just because coal is a lower stage of development than, let's say, cars. Um, cars are mid twentieth century development. Coal is early to mid industrial. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, and, and te- yeah, textiles is also um, early, very early industrial. Textiles is what uh, textiles are what Bangladesh is doing. Um, Bangladesh is developing very well through textiles. Um, everyone likes slagging on Matt Iglesias, so, um, often justifiably, but when he, but when his reaction to the Rana Plaza fire was, let Bangladesh decide its own standards, it knows how to grow. Um, Rana Plaza was, I think, around here. And this has also been accompanied by, but, and also because this is a um, very labor-intensive development, unlike in India, for example. Um, um, Bangladesh has also had extensive social development. Um, and, uh, okay, let's, instead of GDP per capita, let's see if we can do... 
okay, what kind of social are they going to show us? Um, okay, so life expectancy at birth is higher in Bangladesh than in India. Um, okay, all of them have net emigration because people move to richer countries. Um, Bangladesh is way, so Bangladesh is way lower emissions than India and basically the same GDP per capita. Um, textiles are not a high, are not a polluting industry. India did um, socialist development in the 1950s um, and, and 60s, so lots of coal. Uh, Bangladesh is not as electrified as India, but it's close. Um, what else is there? Okay, they're not? Okay. Um, let's see if I can do total fertility rate, because uh, fertility rate total. Um, so Bangladesh actually has a lower TFR than India. Um, and again, this is recent social development in Bangladesh. And uh, my understanding is that in India, Muslim women have higher, for, ha have higher TFRs, and the North has higher TFR than the South. So, like, the parts of India that are maybe most comparable to Bangladesh, I mean, maybe not West Bengal, West Bengal is different, but, um, are, um, um but, 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 but North Indian Muslims, I think, have, would, would be more than 2.2. Um, and this is not some kind of, oh, women just don't want to have, this is not like a Korean type situation or a Russian type situation where nobody has children. This is like, if the, this is where if the TFR is high, it's like women are kind of confined at home. Bangladesh has higher, um, Share of women who are working, um, higher F, uh, um, labor force participation rate. Um, like essentially, this is I mean, essentially uh, and I need female. Um, no, um, not that India is trending now. Um, Bangladesh trended down is essentially at this point flat, um, or even a little rising. But anyway, um, yeah, yeah, and yeah, Bangladesh is way uh, younger than India. However, India also has India has high but semi reasonable metro construction costs. Essentially, it kind of has its own domestic capacity for this, even though it wants to be Japan. Bangladesh literally privatizes the state of Japan and has exactly the uh, it has exactly the quality of infrastructure that you would expect of a poor country that privatizes um, its infrastructure to Japan. Um, at any rate, um, at, at any rate, I'm not going to anymore. I don't need to actually think about Matic Glaciers. Um, but um, but but the point is that um, the economic development in Britain that is most moralized would be probably Victorian. Like the, the Victorian era was kind of the peak. What was the peak of British power? So people romanticize that, um, and they romanticize the cities were that were current then, um, which is I think why people. Which is I think why only very recently have people started taking a serious look at the poverty in Birmingham. Um, I mean, Birmingham also stayed wealthy longer because, precisely because Birmingham was somewhat of a newer economy, like early to mid 20th century economy, and not a uh, 19th century one. But um, like like the actual north, but um, um, but also I don't think it has been as moralized. And in the United States, uh, when did American power peak? The answer is 1945. Um, so people in America romanticize again Cleveland and Detroit. Um, Detroit more than Cleveland. Um, but, um, and it, to the point that I would argue that the most American state, or rather the most real American state, are either are Michigan and Pennsylvania. Um, not New York, New York is New York. New England is New England. Texas is Texas. I mean, yeah, Texas thinks it's real America, but everyone mocks how much they love their guns and giant everything with low quality. Um... The South, again, thinks it's real America, but um, the one time, or rather the two times that the North told them to kindly um, oppress black people less, um, the South fought back, the South lost, because most of America was not the South. Um, 
So, and, and, and I mean, Iowa, everyone pretends like Iowan farmers are like the most American people. Like, uh, I think uh, Captain Kirk, right, on Star, on Star Trek, I think is supposed to be from Iowa. Um, it has this kind of all-American vibe to it, but even Iowa is, I mean, most Americans are not farmers, whereas Michigan and Pennsylvania, I think, are um, uh, are more kind of the real, kind of like the most average America, if that makes sense. Um, also, also linguistically, so... Um, in, uh, so there's something called the Northern City Vowel Shift. Um, really cool accent, um, which I struggle not to adopt whenever I'm in, let's say, Chicago. Um, just go on this and remember that this is Wikipedia, and it's a really cool subject, which means that you are very likely to be uh, spending forever clicking through links. I did that in uh, college while professors were lecturing. Um, so it may be less of Scranton and Allentown, but certainly upstate New York, the Great Lakes region. Um, and the point is that this uh, accent, even though this accent is very much not the standard accent in, the, in, in American English, but because it's a region that is not negatively stereotyped, the accent is not negatively stereotyped. Um, because kind of the peculiar, because even though it is a peculiarity, it is even a slightly politicized peculiarity. Um, uh, in the late 20th century, it was a liberal-ish accent, like um, people who vote for Democrats, and to the point that cities that didn't, um, but like city regions that didn't, um, kind of resisted it. Uh, but, um, but, but, I mean, there, there have been shifts since, like, I mean, the Midwest is different, but, um, is different now, but, yeah, Kansas, um, is, uh, yeah, Superman, is, uh, yeah, is Dust Bowl. Um, yeah, the primary standard is, it's not California, um, but, yeah, it's, um, more, um, rural, uh, Great Plains, like, I think Nebraska, um, is very favored this way, but the point is that, um, Michigan Again, Michigan is not, uh, like, Michigan is not standard, okay? Um, yeah, exactly. Um, the, the Michigan accent is not standard. Um, the way people speak, the, the way people talk, the, the way people talk in, in, in the suburbs of Detroit, n n not, in the, not in the city of Detroit, because the city of Detroit is um, predominantly black, and this is, and, uh, and, and this is, uh, uh, and this is a white accent. Um, regional accents in American in, in American English um, are um, um, are a uh, um, are a white thing. Um, there are there are um, regional differences in uh, in, uh, in in African American English, um, but they're um, but they're uh, they're a little bit different. Um, so so these um, atlases of American English accents, they're uh, the, these atlases are most uh, are mostly for how um, uh, white people speak. Um, you, you see, this is not, I mean, this is not quite standard American English, what I just said. But anyway, um, um, yeah, Canadian English, yeah, Canadian English is also extremely standard if you remember to pronounce the word about correctly. But anyway, the point is that this is a very moralized, very positively moralized region. Um, and, uh, which is why I think it was, I think was a bigger shock that um, Trump won by winning Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, that that Bush won by winning Florida, and and even Ohio. I mean, and even Ohio, but Ohio was always a little more conservative. And but but the point is that people constantly ask what it's going to do for these regions, like almost to the point they're viewed um, as kind of a foil to the worst moralized East Coast. And yeah, these regions are currently poorer, but this is a current thing. Um, the incomes in metropolitan, and this is something I should have really, uh, there's something I really should have done before stream the way I um, had this prepared, um, or the maps prepared. Um, so instead you're going to watch me uh, trying to figure out um, per capita income by region interactive. What the hell are you doing? Tools. Regional facts. Um, did they just do, did they just redo the website or something? Okay, um, national data, do I have, do I have regional data? Yes, I do. Um, uh, interactive data tables is what I'm looking for. 
and now we're just waiting for the internet to work. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, personal income and employment. Um, we need economic profile, and they um, removed the codes from each, uh, and they removed the codes from every uh, table, which means that I need to rem actually memorize with, um, tables. And, um, per capita net earnings, um, if you're European, gross means before tax, net means after tax. If you're American, this is not what these terms mean. Net uh, just means from work. So... Let's do percent of US. It's probably the best. And let's see if it's going to show me all, if it's going to let me um, map all years, if we're going to need to download the table again. I'm pretty sure I've downloaded the same table about eight times. No, it's actually working. Okay, uh, it's working. Let me um, kill my face so that you can see more of the table. Would Milwaukee be able to piggyback better off of Chicago with the rail connection? Maybe. I mean, yes, but only in the sense that Providence and Worcester piggyback off of Boston. Like, it's... Essentially, it would suburbanize Milwaukee. Like, it would turn Milwaukee into a kind of a Boston suburb, which is not necessarily the worst thing in the world, but it is what it is. Okay, so look. Cleveland, Ohio, in, the 19, in 1969, which is the first year for which there's data, is... Um, these numbers, by the way, are normalized so that 100 is the U.S. average this year. So... The numbers here go down from one one from, from like what what did you say one eleven point eight to uh let's say one hundred exactly thirty years later or nine years later but it's not that Cleveland declined it relatively declined but I mean America nineteen ninety eight is a lot richer than in nineteen sixty nine and we can kind of see that there is a bit and for some reason this. Uh, it's showing me the exact journeys, and I can't see as much of the table. But you can see this with, with a lot of the Midwest, but um, and not just the Midwest. Atlanta had the same problem. Atlanta, the late 90s. Atlanta, 10 years later. Atlanta, Atlanta had a big economic collapse in the 2000s that went mostly unremarked. Um, which, again, I suspect it's because it's not as moralized as, let's say, Detroit and Cleveland, where every adverse change is very uh, um, uh, it, it, it is, it is very definitively noted and uh, it is always noted and always studied discussed in uh, um, very discussed by think tanks and mass media um, so anyway Cleveland relatively declines in the 70s um, but Really, it's more of an 80s feature that takes it down to about from about 110 to 100, and then in the 2000s, it's it starts in the late 90s at 100, um, bottoms around 93 ish, and has not really recovered. Um, Trump is elected here. Trump leaves office here. So it's not even that Trump made that part of America great again. Lol. Um, and, um, this, and let's say, and in Barbara Irish, let's say you look at Denver. So Denver is much wealthier than the rest of the United States. Um, Denver used to be poorer than Cleveland, but Denver is, Denver w was sunbelt growth to the point that when the narrative flipped from the sunbelt is growing because it is more moral than the decadent Northeast to, um, those decadent Northeasterners are stealing money from hardworking Americans because Denver remains wealthy throughout this era. Um, kind of Denver, nobody considers Denver to be sunbelt anymore in American political discourse. Um, and now Detroit. Detroit was, in 1969, wealthy. 20% wealthier than the rest of the United States. Let's peruse the table and see what's wealthier than Chicago, slightly wealthier than Detroit. Um, everything else we're seeing on this table is poorer than Detroit. Hartford is slightly poorer than Detroit. Uh, oh, Vegas apparently was very wealthy. Um, also, there are a few people over there in 1960. Um, L.A., um, very wealthy at the time. Actually, L.A. also went into a little bit of a relative decline. But um, but again, it's always moralized. Um, 
Okay, New York was slightly wealthier than Detroit in 1969. New York also went through a big decline in the 70s. It's just that it recovered and um, is now, I don't want to say as wealthy as it's ever been, relatively speaking, because New York, New York actually was the, probably New York's big wealth relative to the rest of the US was early 20th century. Um, I think in 1930, the wealthiest states were New York, California, Massachusetts, Jersey, maybe, or New York, California, Massachusetts, Illinois. Uh, maybe not, no, it would not be Massachusetts, it's not 1930. Uh, probably New York, California, Illinois, Jersey, or something like that. Um, and um, and so New York, and, and there was just a lot of relative decline in New York in the 1950s and 60s when the rest of the country got television. Um, and so Detroit starts out really wealthy in what is viewed as the heyday of America, which is 1940s, 50s, 60s. Almost as wealth, like wealthier than Seattle, almost as wealthy as San Francisco, which is always been wealthier, or New York, um, or, or Washington. And then Detroit declines from 120. Um, at, at this point now, this is 1969. Okay, in 1969, Detroit has already had race riots. Detroit in the 1970s is already a byline for post-industrial decline. Just because, but not, but the region is not in decline. Only the city is. There's just, there's a lot of wealth there. The wealth is just on the other side of Eight Mile Road. And in 1978, even after the oil crisis makes American cars less desirable than Japanese cars, which are good at being at, at making it at making small fuel efficient cars in the United States, cars like that existed, um, small fuel efficient cars, but they were starter cars. They were not meant to be good. They were meant to be the car you get when you're poor, um, so that you can graduate to a bigger Chevy. Um, not the poor, it now Houston is of course very wealthy, high oil price because of high oil prices. Um, after the oil crisis, um, noted in this era. Detroit, again, 1970 is about 120. So, again, we're seeing some um, oil regions that are richer, but in 1970, Detroit is wealthier than New York, wealthier than, than the New York region. And then, um, okay, not quite as wealthy as San Francisco, but almost. And then what happens subsequently is the auto industry hollows out. Um, so, uh, Detroit and Denver are basically the same here. And then, within a few years, Detroit doesn't quite collapse, so it never actually, um, but it, it is in decline. And then it stabilizes, still at a wealthy rate. The Detroit of 2000 has high incomes, not as high as Denver, not as high as New York, but well above national average. And then in the 2000s, it goes from 115 to a bottom of 90, 91. Now, it does recover because the auto bailout, again, Detroit is so moralized that the auto bailout centered it. So it did get a little better, relatively speaking, before kind of going back down again. But but the point is that there's been so much moralization of Detroit and Cleveland that, uh, um, that you can just look at, is this going to revitalize the city, the city these, these regions? The income tax amendment? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, but people hated New York. Yeah, in the 1910s, everyone hated New York for being wealthy and also full of Jews and Italians. Then it flipped to being uh, poor and like demanding government subsidies after having sub um, subsidized the rest of the country for its entire existence. And maybe then they would also say full of Jews and Italians that they either thought it or just said full of um, blacks and Puerto Ricans and now it's back to uh, um, now it's back to hated for being richer than the rest of the country, but but the point is that um, what is it going to do for Cleveland? Um, I, I kind of want to talk about this for a moment. So again, Cleveland has to build itself from something. Lots of people live there, but how is it going to build itself up from? Can it do something like what Lille did? Yeah, it absolutely can. Um, it absolutely can do what Lille did. Um, and how would it work? Well. Cleveland is not as close to Chicago as Lille is to anything. Um, Chicago to Cleveland is about 550 kilometers. It's about 550 kilometers. Um, and this is going to be, and 
technically it's the straight line is a little less, but it goes through the lake. If you go past the lake, it's not quite 550, but um, but also remember this is the Midwest. Everything is flat and straight. Um, also, because it's flat and straight, you should expect very high average speed. So, to, so 550 kilometers can be done in two hours. Um, okay, so Le so so not Le uh, Cle Cleveland becomes it gets to be two hours from Chicago. Um, I'm guessing probably about three and a bit, let's say 3.15, 3.20-ish, maybe three and a half from New York City. Um, but remember, there's no real reason for a new industry to locate itself in Cleveland. Um, that is the problem. That, that is essentially why you can't do these kind of um, infrastructure as industrial policy measures. I mean, you can. They will just waste money and not do anything. And the reason is that um, if I'm opening a new business... <laughs> Why would I do it in Cleveland? If I'm looking for um, high value added, high skill occupations, I want to go where there are thick markets for um, very educated people. I'm going to go to the Bay Area. I'm going to go to the Northeast, maybe Seattle, Denver. Um, I don't really have a reason to go to Cleveland. If I'm open, now if I'm trying to instead do a low cost business, um, I'm trying to just do something labor intensive where I have, where there's some going to be there's going to be some advantage in uh, low wages. The Midwest is not great for that either. The Midwest is more unionized than the South. The Midwest has higher wages than the South. Um, Midwestern Republicans have been doing a lot of work on deunionizing, um, mostly because they hate unions, but it's supposed to also create economic development. Except it has it in Wisconsin, for example. Wisconsin has seen a collapse in union density. Um, but that doesn't lower wages in general. I mean, you're, you, I mean, at the end of the day, industrial wages are industrial wages. You still need. I mean, I mean all, all you can do is um, own the lids with this. Um, that's in owning the lids or owning the cons or more owning the socialists. That's not economic development. That's almost like a kind of consumption. It's like the modern political equivalent of when a king in a wealthy country gets a really shiny golden palace. And I mean, yeah, these will this will correlate with high income and then everyone will look at the golden palace and say, oh, wealthy people have what wealthy kings have that. We should get that ourselves. And then they and, and, and then they waste all of the kingdom's resources until they become a colony of um a country that is bigger slash spent the money on the military instead of on the golden palace. Um and so um it's not gonna turn Cleveland into the next New York, or even the next Chicago. Now, wait, now the question is, is it a waste? Absolutely not. People are going to write it. Is it going to do bad for Cleveland? No, it's not. It is going to improve Cleveland. It is going to be, do good things for Cleveland. Um, but it's going to, and it's going to, and to the extent it's going to be good for Cleveland, it's specifically because um, the local elites in a place like Cleveland, like Cleveland, are parasitic. This is also, by the way, true of the local elites in place in a place like New York. Um, the, the political elites in a place like New York are fucking awful. Um, the business elites are different. I mean, the business elites, I mean, everyone likes mocking finance, mostly because it's a it's a nice way of saying, I hate the Jews, without saying I hate the Jews. Um, seriously, compare how many people mock finance with how many people mock oil or the car industry. And, and maybe the car industry in America is very positively moralized, but the oil industry, is nobody likes the oil industry, but people also don't constantly say oil stir. Whereas they absolutely will say banks are. Um, anyway, the um, but in but in but in, in a declining place, often the issue is that the economic elites are also kind of parasitic. They are very closely connected with the political elites. A lot of it is just local power, where at some level the distinction between private and public sector doesn't really exist anymore. I mean, the, the, the national level, yeah. I mean, there are politicians, there are civil servants. There are business. There are people in business. Is there a revolving door problem? Yes, there is in the United States. Much less, of, much less so um, in Northern Europe. But is a problem. Um, but there's still a very sharp distinction between: Are you a lawyer for the government or are you a lawyer for a big business? And at a very local, at the very local level, this distinction decreases. Um, and to the point that, to, and to the extent that it essentially forces the local elites to, I don't want to call it parlotarize, but to, I don't know, 
become middle management in a larger concern that does create more development. But it's again, it's creates more development in a direction that is exactly the opposite of what local business owners in Cleveland have. It essentially means that the workers can take the train, can, can form connections in Chicago by taking the train two hours. And if they don't like the job that they have in Cleveland, they can move. Not even just to Chicago, even to, I mean, even just a bigger pool of workers, even within the, the non-Chicago parts of the Midwest, so it's called Cleveland, Detroit, Columbus, Cincinnati, even things that are not quite Midwest, like Pittsburgh. Um, it's just more mobility this way. And yeah, I mean, it, it, it forces Cleveland businesses to compete. So it does stand the... It, it, it so it does stand a chance of creating more economic development in Cleveland, just not in the way that the business owners hope for. Local business owners being an extremely anti-developmental um, interest group, um, and um, to the extent there's going to be physical developments like new buildings, um, probably it's going to be more residential than commercial because Cleveland is not a place with a very high demand central business district. There are cool buildings in Cleveland. It's an American downtown. Um, it's a historic, but let's call it 20th century historic, not 18th century or 19th century historic downtown. And honestly, even like a 18th, 19th century story downtown. Providence has skyscrapers. Providence and New Haven have skyscrapers. I mean, they're not from 18th century, but Providence and New Haven have skyscrapers. Um, and um, there are skyscrapers in Cleveland. Um, I don't think they're especially high demand. Um, so quite a lot of the demand is not going to be office. It's probably going to be more residential. So um, you can do body problem. You can. Uh, it, it's, it's a good location if you work. Probably going to be in Chicago. Um, and you, if you if like uh, you have one spouse in Chicago, one spouse somewhere in Ohio, and um, they um, work from home a couple days a week, for example, I think that is going to be viable. Oh, God. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. Um, but so this is something where it actually is going to have an impact on a section of Cleveland, a section of Toledo, especially everywhere where you could actually create some kind of, I don't want to say high-speed commuting to Chicago um, because it's too far for that, but high-speed, let's call it semi-regular travel, like a day a week, two days a week, something like that. Um, or, or people spending weekends, and this is probably going to induce residential in Cleveland just because the commerce, the, um, because the center is going to be Chicago. As I said, it improves the economic complexity um, of a region, but um, often in a core periphery dynamic. And while the United States in general doesn't have the sharp core periphery dynamic of Japan or France, the Midwest does. The Midwest, so the Midwest does have regions that are richer than Chicago, namely Minneapolis. I'm not sure whether it's a coincidence it's also the farthest away or possibly so cold that people demand higher wages to live there. I am not sure. I'm honestly not sure. Um, but, um, but for the most part, Chicago is the core, and then these places, St. Louis and so on, um, are periphery. And high speed rail is going to reinforce that. It's just going to mean that the periphery is going to have a core of people who are, instead of being local business owners who lament that their children are moving away, it's going to be a core of people who are the most connected to the core, to the bigger core, which in this case would be Chicago or for Cleveland might include might dabble in Chicago and the East Coast is work is why um, it's going to probably have a bigger effect, a bigger. I'm not going to say positive effect. I mean, it is positive, but a bigger shuffle effect or a bigger change effect on Cleveland than on a place that's just the periphery of Chicago, like St. Louis, like Milwaukee. Um, or even Indianapolis. Um, I mean, yeah, but would get three-hour trains or something like that. The train trains in three hours to Atlanta, but um, Atlanta is not New York. Atlanta wishes, but Atlanta is not New York. Um, so anyway, this is the effect this has on cities. I, it's not going to be the oh my god, this is like the difference between um, Parable of the Sower and um, Terra Ignata. Um, it's not that, oh my god, amazing, but it is a change. It is, it is a change that is even, to some extent, positive. It's just, it's something that can still coexist with a lot of poverty 
away from the influence radius of the train station and the influence radius in Lille. It is, the influence radius in, in Lille is measured in blocks, not even kilometers. Um, and yeah, this is, this is what high speed rail does. I mean, it does mean that Clevelanders are going to be able to take a train to Chicago and um, very easily, and they can even day trip there. Um, or, or, or even to Philadelphia, or, or even to Philadelphia, or even New York. It's gonna be, it's gonna get strained. But I mean, I used to day trip multiple times from New York to Providence. Most of my New York to Providence trips were not day trips, but I have day trip that. And this is by Amtrak. I rode regional on a Sela, so this would have been probably about three hours forty. Um, if I uh, wake up sufficiently early in the morning, which I mean, I don't even mean five. I mean seven. I can do that. Um, nap on the train. Um, and yeah, this is what this does to a place like Cleveland. I didn't discuss Albany at all, but I expect this is going to be broadly the same with Albany. I say broadly because Albany is a state capital, because um, and therefore it means that kind of the economic capital to political capital relationship is going to be much closer. I want to maybe say more democratized because ordinary people will be able to take more trips, but I don't actually know. I mean, it, it's also going to increase everyone's Albany to New York trips, both, um, let's call it, ordinary people, which include activists who are not extremely plugged in, um, but I'm, who I'm setting aside from politicians, um, people at, qua at the millions of quangos that New York State and New York City has. Um, and I'm going to say at I don't mean mid-level planner, I mean head of such a quantum political appointee, lobbyist. Um, again, both, uh, again, I expect the ordinary people are going to um, see a relatively larger increase in travel just because it's going to be convenient and normally New Yorkers don't really have a reason to go to Albany. Um, but but I'm going to reserve judgment. Um, so, so I don't know to what extent it's going to have a big impact on the politics of New York State um, and, and the power structure in New York State. But it is going to, um, but it is going to have an impact. It's just that Cleveland has a much more local elite, and in Albany, so much of the elite is modeled in the state government that they can't ignore New York. Um, these are not people who live their children go to the city. These are people who, I mean, the townies maybe, but I mean the townies don't know. Um, yeah, <coughs> yeah. Wherever the Shinkansen station is, like a. Wait, I thought Niigata was a. I thought Niigata was a was a historic station, not a new station. Um, as, as opposed to, uh, I, I mean, I know she. I, I mean, I know there's um, um, something like um, um, like Shane Omori, but I thought that um, Niigata was Niigata, not um, she Niigata. Um, yeah, by the way, um, once we're at it, uh, while we're at it, not once, while we're at it, um, this is likely to have a big effect in, uh, a, a big effect on Albany to the point that they even wrote it into some alt history that among much bigger changes also had more rail oriented North, um, English, uh, North America. Um, and, um, because the train station in, uh, Old Albany is on the Rensselaer side, it's on the Rensselaer side, not on the Albany side. Um, this area on the east side of the Hudson, on, on the left bank of the Hudson, develops. It's set in the old history to develop more. Um, I expect it to actually happen. So because the train station in Albany is not in the city, but in Rensselaer, here, right across from the city, and getting it into the city is such a chore that I don't think it's valuable. Um, like essentially, you're going to need to do some kind of Hudson crossing. Um, it's just that probably the easiest place to cross the Hudson is... The, is the current Hudson Crossing here. Um, can you build one in the south? Yeah, you absolutely can, but this is not the best. Um, it's not the best approach. Um, so likely the station is, and, and also the right of way here is gone because of the freeway. So if the station is here, as is the likeliest, then, yeah, it's just going to mean, I mean, it's going to mean that, for example, there's going to be a lot of pressure to make this walkable because, as you can see on Google Earth, this is not walkable. Um, it's going to be a lot of residential development here, more commercial development on this side. Um, but um, 
Um, but again, this is pretty unique to Albany. Usually um, in the United States, it's very easy in, in major cities to, or even Albany size cities, to get the historic train station to be the high speed rail station. Yeah, with Canada, I mean, the problem with Canada is Canada has bigger tails. Because in Canada, um, so first of all, Canada needs the um, legacy approach in Toronto. They also used to need it in Montreal, but they gave it away. Um, but the other issue is that in Canada, I mean, yeah, you can do, you can just build this, I guess. Or if you really like Kingston, um, build like this. It's fine. I mean, call it the. I mean, if the if the lines get, if the lines ever have colors, this would be the, the line through Kingston. Obviously, has to be called the Scarlet Line. Uh, the line's gonna be, or or maybe the purple line. Something that's very uh, creepy. If you got if you got what I'm saying, um, and uh, the. Um, but the problem with, uh, but the problem with this is that then there are questions, okay, how do, what do you do for trains that go all the way to Quebec City? I mean, I imagine you just make them transfer. That's viable, I think. I think. Um, but it might be, but especially if this doesn't exist, I don't know if you guys can see it, especially if this doesn't exist, um, it, and even if, it would be probably a good idea to make this a viable extension. If it's at all possible, in the same way that um, in in Boston, it would really cool to make Boston to Portland a viable low speed extension. It just I don't think it's viable just because of how the north south rail link has to be set up for regional trains. Um, and so so there are drawbacks with the Japanese approach. Um, and I think Canada should think about them. I mean, if Canadian National and Canadian Pacific are being assholes, then that's worse than um, not running through to Quebec City, right? But, Yeah, um, go to Kingston, yeah, that's also, I mean, so, so here's the thing. Um, there's this kind of annoying tendency that I see in North America to self-negotiate and then talk about high-speed trains between L.A. and Fresno before they go to San Francisco. If the train only gets to Fresno, it does not need to be high-speed. Yeah, you can, if the line has only been built there, you can, like, buy 200 or 250 kilometers an hour high-speed trains and attempt to run them at a profit and emphasize attempt. But there's no really need to run expensive high speed trains until you hit the major city. And in Canada, it's not even Toronto to Ottawa, it's Toronto to Montreal. Now, yeah, you can do, instead of this line, you can do the creep line, the uh, purple line, the scarlet line, um, whatever you want to call it, um, the she was there before Neeb line. Uh, and. Um, um, she crawled so that Neb so that Neb could walk. Neb walked so that Sarah, so that Sarah could run. And uh, the uh, um, and so again, you could do either. Um, it's really not that important. Um, these are not large cities. Um, per, um, Peterborough and, and, and Kingston. And um, the um, but. Things like connections onward to the United States are going to be very valuable if they can get the fares to not be Eurostar fares and the speed to not be um, um, Paris to Frankfurt speed, or rather I should say French-German border to Frankfurt average speed. The speed on the French side is actually really good because Strasbourg. Um, and then, then they can actually get ridership, and then that would... I mean, and, and, and then it would be useful to be able to run through. Um, I mean, it can, but I want to caution that this is, like, Toronto and Montreal are not huge cities, and it's very easy to say, oh, um, what about Paris to Lyon? But remember, Paris to Lyon is not Paris to Lyon. Paris to Lyon is Paris to, let's let's see what is within a radius of 100 kilometers of Montreal, and, or, or 50 or whatever your favorite number is, and compare that with, uh, okay, I'm just going to put go here and be kind of lazy about the exact center. Um, so this is 100, so this is 100, so you don't quite get to Ottawa. What's within 100 kilometers of Montreal? 
Plattsburgh, New York. That is what is within 100 kilometers of Montreal. Um, you're not quite at Burlington. You're not quite at Trois Rivières. You're not. You, you, you're not at Ottawa. And now let's compare this with what's 100 kilometers from Lyon. Um, this is where population density starts mattering. Um, usually, people overrate it, but this is a, an example where it's very easy to get it wrong and look the other way and underrate it. So, 100 kilometers from Lyon, what do we have? Not quite, um, not quite Genève, um, but Grenoble. Um, that's a metro area of half a million people. Uh, Saint Etienne, another half a million people. Um, Valence, Macon, um, there are a bunch of others. Um, so uh, I think I don't remember their populations because I haven't actually memorized what the. the but I haven't memorized French metropolitan areas down to like two hundred thousand people each, like the Macon, uh, the Bourg, the, the Vienne, the Valence, um, set. But there's quite a lot of population here, and most of these cities get a get a couple daily th- get a couple daily direct train trains. So this is why this by itself is is not a bad line, but it's a marginal line. Like, if the United States does not ex- did not exist, this would be a blue line. Um, in, in, my, in, in the way that I'm... Um, so, this is where... This is the, the, the part where if you don't have Metcalfe's Law to help you, then you're facing some really brutal... Um, you're facing some really brutal um, cost-effectiveness... Calculations. You can still make it, but it's not going to be amazing. It's, it's going to be something. It's the same in Australia. In Australia, it's. I mean, you can have a kind of counterfactual. What if Canada, but no US? It's this counterfactual is called Australia. Um, Australia is even lower density. Um, these are even farther apart. A train can a train can be cost effective. Like a, a train can be economically profitable. Um, doing. Brisbane to Sydney to uh, Melbourne, but first of all, these are long distances. And in Australia, these are longer distances than in Canada. Um, distances of people can still take trains, but I mean, but these are not distances that murder the airline industry. Toronto to Montreal, there are not going to be there if there are trains at normal speed. There aren't going to be planes. Sydney to Melbourne direct line, which is collinear with Canberra, so it's, it's seven twenty. To Brisbane, it is also 720. I'm guessing it's going to be 800 in practice. This is about three. I mean, there's not going to be anything in there, so it's going to be three hours of a high speed train um, or three and a half hours. This flights will exist. They will not be as common, but they will exist probably mostly for the purposes of uh, um, connection to, uh, uh, to an international flight um, or to Perth. Um, but the thing is, these are these are. Big-ish cities, but within 100 kilometers of Sydney, all we have is Sydney. Okay, like the the closest significant city to Sydney that is not Sydney is Canberra, and it's 250 kilometers away. Um, I guess Britain has Gold Coast, but that's not large enough by itself to sustain anything. Um, this is again, this is where population density matters. Can Australia build this? Yes. Should it? Yes, provided it can build at French costs and not at British costs. But it's one of those things where, it's, where if you don't have good cost control, you're just going to waste money. And I don't mean you're going to waste money in the sense that this is not as profitable. I mean, it's just going to be worse than if nothing had happened. Um, yes, poor Newcastle. Um, let me actually try to figure out where Newcastle is. Um I apologize for not having memorized the uh, um, map of uh, Australia. Okay, yeah, Newcastle, I guess, is what distance to Sydney? Not 100. 111. Um, technically, it's not. So, yeah, it's. I guess it is close ish, but how many people live there? 
There are about a million cities called Newcastle. Um, Newcastle NSW is 400,000 people. It's not nothing, but Lyon has two independent places that are much closer, that are slightly larger, that is to say Saint-Étienne and Grenoble, and one place that is about the same distance, and is much larger, which is um, Geneva. Okay, yeah, I mean, yes, it was, all, I mean, yes, it was named after, I mean, yes, Newcastle, the Australian Newcastle was named after the British one in honor of its coal industry. Um, a little bit of how, like, how, Birmingham, how Birmingham was named after Birmingham because it was supposed to be an industrial center, um, which at one point it was before it, we became better known for other things such as... Um, creative use of uh, attack dogs. Um, I guess some people were playing Red Alert before, um, decades before Red Alert came out. Um, so, yeah, the... Um, so, so this is, like, the issue with high-speed rail. And, I mean, I'm going to go back to this on Tuesday when I'm actually going to go back and essentially fix this map. I already pre-did it. Right now, new HSR map and old HSR map are identical. I'm going to change new HSR map on stream. Um, so please tune in on Tuesday. Even if you're European and if you want, and if you want me to talk about European issues, not American ones, I will go back to European issues as I did when I talked today about Lille. It's just that um, this, if I if we weren't committing to to doing to talking about Lille and Cleveland today, I would have been honestly crowning this just because. Apparently, there's another Twitter flame war that, um, even though I'm not on Twitter, I keep seeing in my mentions, and people are even taking it to Mastodon, um, in which people appear to believe, I don't actually know what they appear to believe, other than it's mostly personal opinions about um, Matt Iglesias's, about the shape of Matt Iglesias's face. Um, but um, anyway... I want to finish this now, but if you have a question or two, I will answer. And I'm going to uh, eat, finish eating a cookie on stream. I don't know. All right. Yeah, this is also an American issue, and um, and the US I wouldn't say literally self-contained, but in the US, and this is something that I this is probably a blog post that I've owed people for years. Um. So people in the US think they're trying to be Germany, Germany being an interconnected legacy rail system rather than fewer but faster um, high-speed lines. Um, now, nobody in the United States even knows how to beat Germany, which means things like time transfers. Um, but um, the, um, but the intransigence of the freight does, um, that does mean that the United States should probably be more Japan or France than it, is, than it should be Germany. Um, there's also, I mean, Germany, um, a lot of the stuff that is just not, that would just not be on a mostly high speed network is things that are not intercity, but are not even the equivalent of Boston or maybe the equivalent of Boston to Portland or probably more like Boston to Cape Cod or, um, Syracuse to Watertown. And if you're wondering where Watertown is, it is north of Syracuse near the Canadian border, roughly near, uh, Fort Drum. Uh, like the, the area around Fort Drum, where, where the 10th Mountain Division is, um, might actually be the only big military installation in the, the big army installation in the northeast. And the northeast is pretty demilitarized. But um, the 
Yeah, France does interme um, intermingling. Japan is wholly self-contained. Um, the issue is not wholly self-contained. The, the issue is how dependent you are on um, an interconnected um, network on which freight trains also run. France does have that. France does have that, and those lines suck. Um, Germany has that, and those lines suck as well, and people in, in Germany, too, should be building a network of passenger-dedicated lines, essentially completing the high-speed network that they showed at the beginning of the stream, um, just because it's going to make the trains more reliable. It's something that people in Germany don't get because they are too used to looking down on France and, well, French. German trains are more reliable than French trains. German intercity trains are less reliable than Tajavaz, and um, they're less reliable even while having extreme levels of timetable padding, I think 25%. Um, like 22 to 30% on top of the tactical travel time. Um, but again, this is a preview of what I'm going to talk about on Tuesday. And um, if there are no more questions, then I would like to um, to end this. I have been trying to do streams that are not more than two hours long, going back to twice a week. Going, not going back, going up to twice a week. Um, but as, as I said, I don't remember if I said it before I started recording or after I started recording. Um, the stream length that I plan on, the stream length that actually takes place, ain't ever exactly been similar. Yeah, uh, I would not call them German stations. Um, I, To the extent that there's a European, for California high-speed rail, to the extent that they have a uh, European analog without their doing the stations, it is the United Kingdom, because these stations are so massively oversized to the point that Bay Area rail fans have for 15 years been mocking the plans for the Cahill Street station in San Jose as Diridon Pangalactic. Um, it's even worse in Britain. In Britain, they're building they're building oversized stations because they think it's difficult to um, have something like six or eight trains per hour on a single platform um, or on a single platform track, which is something that is extremely un which is something that exists in Europe but is very uncommon and something where they need to look to either European corner case or to Japan, whereas in California. That they can just look down to the look at to like very vanilla European cases. Um, it's it's very much doing the American approach to infrastructure, not the France one. The France one is not that expensive for one. Um, you mean ETCS? Means the signal system? Yeah, the um, California Speed Rail is going to use ETCS. Um, California Speed Rail actually picked the signal system before the American freight railroads did. Um, the uh, ETCS had just been uh, had just been successfully installed on the first uh, uh, in-service intercity line in Switzerland in 2008. Um, but anyway, if there are no further questions about like the issue of high-speed rail economic development, we can end this now. Um, thank you all for watching, and I will see you again in uh, if you're watching on, on Twitch in three days if you're watching this on YouTube whenever you watch our next video. Um, and so until then, thank you and ta-ta.